Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see everyone here. I hope you had a nap. I did. Um, and of course, if you didn't realize it yet, we have cookies and coffee and tea and flavored waters over here because we might need sustenance before this is all over. So uh, feel free to get up at any time and help yourself if you'd like to. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about the permanence of ancient Egypt. Um, Egypt is such an extraordinary country and it has always been perceived as being uh, I'll, I'll come back to that it's always been perceived as an extraordinarily exotic country from the very earliest history in fact herodotus the greek founder of modern history writing was fascinated by greece he called the greek people the most religious of all peoples that have ever lived he wrote on it extensively he also sort of made fun of their dog-headed gods as he called them but he was fascinated by it whether it's the golden mask of tutankhamen the the various um hieroglyphics and other artwork that we have in the tombs and in the temples uh, this is from the mortuary temple of uh, hatshepsut which you will have an opportunity to see the awesome one of the eighth wonders of the ancient world which was the pyramids the sphinx um, just an astonishing fascinating culture artistic um, they had perhaps the oldest form of writing ever and i'm going to talk about that today today's talk is about the general history and background of egypt tomorrow morning i will be talking about pharaoh's temples and tombs which is more specific to luxor where we're going to be going and what we're going to be seeing but today we'll learn more broadly about Egypt. One of the other things that's made Egypt fascinating historically is that it is the oldest continuous history of any nation in the world. Since about 3200 BC, we mark the regular written history of Egypt. One of the reasons we say that it's the longest continuous or contiguous history is because in any number of cases, when other countries ended up conquering Egypt, they didn't do what ordinarily happened. Usually when a country conquered another country, when the Assyrians conquered uh, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, they carried them off into captivity and wiped their culture away. When uh, Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world, he forced the people to speak Greek. In other words, the conqueror usually forced the conquered to become like them. In a very strange way, in almost every case that Egypt later on is conquered, whether it be by Alexander or Ptolemy, one of his generals, or the Greeks, they end up becoming Egyptian rather than the other way around. One of the descendants of the, of the Greek general Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals that ruled uh, Egypt, was Cleopatra. She was actually Macedonian in ancestry, but you don't get more Egyptian than Cleopatra. And so it's been this strange thing that Egypt is such a fascinating, beautiful, artistic, exotic country that over and over and over again, countries, other countries that came in easy, even as conquerors became Egyptian. And the Egyptian history, rather than being ended, uh, just continued from that point. So let's talk a little bit about how and why that is. One of the reasons why Egypt has, has very seldom been conquered, and when it did, um, it, it was in only one way really is the geography of egypt egypt as i'm sure you know is uh, it's a significant a large country but only a very small part of egypt can actually be occupied because most of it is desert uh, more than 80 percent of the people live right along the narrow column of the nile river that runs through egypt because that's the only fertile land that's the only place that they can grow crops if you go on the Luxor trip, and I hope you do, it would be a, a shame to come this far and not go to Luxor. If you go on the Luxor trip, you will see what the, the rugged stone mountains and desert look like, and then we will get to the Nile and you'll see all the green, and you'll understand why people can only live in this very narrow column along the Nile. In fact, the Nile is the spine, the heartbeat, it is the source of all that is Egypt. In fact, Herodotus, quoting him again, he said the Egypt is the gift of the Nile. Had it not been for the Nile River, this culture, this extraordinary ancient culture could not have grown up. The separation between the Nile River Valley and the fertile land there, and then all of the desert areas which surround it, the Egyptians had a very clear sense of that. They called the, the fertile Nile River Basin the 
Kemet, or black land, black meaning fertile, where you can grow things, and then outside that, the desert on either side of the Nile was the Deshret, or the red land. Their deities even reflect this, that the god of the desert, or the Deshret, was Set, and Set is the god of chaos, whereas the god of the inundation of the Nile, I'll explain that in a second, was the god Happy, H-A-P-I, but he really was a happy god. He's fat. <laughs> Uh, he's got plants growing on him. He was a reflection of fertility. Everything about their culture was oriented around this Nile. Now, the fact was the Nile had an unusual characteristic in that it would flood every year. They would have an inundation. In good years, it would flood slowly. And as it flooded, it would bring fertile soil, new fertile soil down from the mountains in the south. Um, and that land would be renewed. And so they never had to worry about over farming the territory that they had that they could plant crops in. And then after a period of time, the river would recede. And again, on good years, it would recede slowly and leave them with this new fertile soil that had been washed down uh, to into the Nile River Valley. So this very idea of a yearly and annual renewal is much of what is behind the uh, Egyptian idea of death and rebirth. Of course, the Egyptians believed that they would be reborn, that death was only a passing phase. That's why they built pyramids uh, in the first kingdom to uh, make it possible for their pharaohs to come back and re-inhabit their bodies. That's why they perfected mummification. That's why they put all these riches in their tombs because starting with the culture of the Nile River, that everything was made new and then passed away and then made new again, they developed this idea that people were eternal in the same way that the, the movements of the Nile were eternal. So much of what you can understand about Egypt has to come from an understanding of the Nile River and this annual cycle that they went through. Now in terms of historically, these two images give you an idea of some of the cities that were planted along the Nile. And then over here, I don't know if you can even see it, but you see the little red slashes that are separating the Nile River. And I need to explain to you, the Nile River runs south to north. Its source is down here and it runs north into the Mediterranean Sea, which means the, uh, I'm gonna be talking about the upper and lower Nile. The upper Nile is in the south. The lower Nile is in the north. We don't usually think that way. You know, we think about the Mississippi River, and when you look at a map, north, you know, the north is up. No, the, the idea of the Nile River running from south to north meant that the area up here, uh, the delta area, was called lower Nile. The area down here is the upper Nile, just so you're clear on that, because upper and lower Nile is very important. These red marks over here, back before the, uh, it was all unified, and that's key, I'm going to talk about that, and the people that unified uh, Egypt into one kingdom that led to the pharaohs and all that we think of as Egypt. It, prior to that, there used to be sections of the Nile, each of which was uh, had their own small ruler. These are called, these. each of these little sections in between these red marks were called gnomes, spelled like the city in Alaska, N-O-M-E, gnomes. They were minor sort of uh, uh, government entities ruled over by a local ruler. Those rulers were called nomarchs, sort of like monarchs spelled sideways. <laughs> so these nomarchs would rule over this, this, this small piece of land. There were over 20 of these mo uh, no monarchs, nomarchs, <laughs> nomarchs ruling these gnomes. Eventually, they started deciding, okay, if I can develop a partnership with the guy just to the north of me or just to the south of me, and we can make it a bigger territory, we can be more efficient. And so they started joining together. Eventually, there were two major kingdoms as these gnomes were joined together. And those kingdoms were the upper Nile, which is down here, the lower part, and then the lower Nile, which is primarily the delta. Scholars disagree somewhat in ancient, Ro uh, ancient Egypt whether or not it actually started with Cairo so that it was just the delta. I think, and many scholars think, it was more likely that it was somewhere here along um, uh, Amarna, which is kind of equal or level with the end point of the Sinai Peninsula. So for the most part, I would say this was the lower Nile, this was the upper Nile, and these became two kingdoms. 
they fought each other, they were constantly at war, there was constant difficulty about it, um, and in fact, as they separated Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt, the rulers of those two areas wore different crowns. On the right here, this is the red crown of Lower Egypt, in other words, the area around the delta, and that red crown was called the Deshret, the crown of Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt, which means down south, they wore a, a white crown. This is a crown called the Hejet. It is the white crown of Upper Egypt. Now what happened was eventually, a guy came along named Narmer. Narmer is the one who unified Upper and Lower Egypt in uh, the, around 3000, I'll give you specific dates in a minute, BC, and he created what's called the Shret, which is the unified crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. And you will see this crown. It's the red crown of uh, Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt joined together. This was a major symbol of the joining of these two kingdoms into the one kingdom that we think of as being Egypt. And uh, this was critically important in the history of the whole of Egypt. Narmer, by the way, the name literally means angry catfish. Oh. They liked scary names back then, and I guess they thought catfish were scary because Narmer means scary catfish. Sometimes in the histories he's referred to as minis, so he apparently had a second name. But we have a lot of examples, and you'll notice here, I, I feel like I'm in your all's way and I can't really help it. Um, we'll, you'll, you will see on some of the walls at Luxor and um, Karnak, here we have the red crown of Lower Egypt, or of um, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt is the white one. The white and the red crown being joined together on one ruler. In fact, the pharaohs were called the ruler of the two lands. You will also see other kind of symbolism. There were other symbols that represented the Upper and Lower Egypt, for instance, the, the upper Egypt was represented by the lotus flower. The lower Egypt was represented by the, um, the papyrus flower. And you'll see examples just like this where you have people tying together the lotus and the papyrus into one. Here's another example of it. And tying those two plants which symbolize the upper and lower Egypt into one was a symbol of the joining together of upper and lower Egypt. It's also true that Upper and Lower Egypt had different symbols in terms of the gods that they focused on. In Lower Egypt, they focused on the, um, the cobra god. And in um, Upper Egypt, they focused on the vulture god. Now, you may never have noticed, this is the, the mask of Tutankhamun. It has both the vulture and the cobra on it. That's, a, that's because those two gods, the, the cobra, uh, cobra god and the um, vulture god, represented Upper and Lower Egypt. So this symbolism is everywhere. The joining of Upper and Lower Egypt was the critical point in history for the Egyptian people. Now, I'll give you a couple minutes to memorize this chart. <laughs> At a certain point, you just have to look at a list of things, so there's no real way around it. The early dynastic period, which is, as I said, around 3000, 3100 to 2686, is when Narmer, angry catfish, joined the upper and lower kingdoms together and began the first dynasties of the pharaohs of Egypt. The dynasties were family groups, and there were 31 of them by traditional counting, although some people have wondered whether that those all make sense. So during the early dynastic period, which lasted just over 400 years, they, it was when it all got started. The pharaohs were ruling over, uh, began to rule over a combined Egypt. You then have the Old Kingdom, which is the first period of real development and sophistication, where Egypt becomes a national, an international power. They begin to conquer other countries. They develop their own art form. It is in the Old Kingdom, which lasted just over 500 years, that you get all of the uh, awesome monuments in the north near Cairo, that is, the, the Sphinx and the pyramids. They were built in the Old Kingdom. Once they had gained power and wealth because of being successful on the international stage, 
the Egyptian pharaohs wanted to build tombs for themselves. Remember, they believed they were going to ultimately live forever, and so they built these enormous tombs called pyramids. Well, unfortunately, you can't really miss those tombs, those pyramids, and so they discovered after a while that they were perfect uh, markers for thieves to come. Remember, they thought they were going to come back, that they were going to live forever, so they put all sorts of gold implements, wealth, jewels, all kinds of stuff in these pyramids, in these tombs. And then they got robbed because everybody knew where that stuff was. So later on, the pharaohs decided that wasn't as good an idea to be so showy about where you were buried. After the, the Old Kingdom, we have an intermediate period, I'll mention in the middle, and we have then the Middle Kingdom. Well, let's, let's say this now. The first intermediate period um, was when it broke down for Egypt. The pharaohs lost control of Upper and Lower Egypt together, and in some cases, there were peoples who invaded from outside Egypt and took control for a period of time. You have three major kingdoms, the old, middle, and the new kingdoms, and then you have three intermediate periods where things kind of broke down after each of those. So the middle kingdom was when they really developed, it grew to its widest range in terms of a controlling area that ran all the way up almost to Syria, all of the Palestine and all of that area, south through Nubia. Egypt was the major world power, and it grew to that in the middle kingdom. And then in the New Kingdom, most of what you think about, other than pyramids and the Sphinx, happened in the New Kingdom. Virtually everything we will see in Luxor, um, the Temple of Luxor, the Temple of Karnak, the, um, the memorial chapel or memorial of um, site of Queen Hatshepsut, it's hard to say that with dry mouth, Hatshepsut, say it again, Hatshepsut. We will see that. We will see the Valley of the Kings. Now, the Valley of the Kings, and then there's a Valley of the Queens, they were designed to hide the tombs. Remember that all the big tombs that were built, the, the pyramids and whatnot, in the first kingdom, the old kingdom, got robbed because they were really obvious. This is why they are still discovering tombs of pharaohs and ancient nobles from Egypt is because they started burying this stuff and covering up the entrance in the hopes they would not be found and robbed. Well, they were. The reason Tutankhamun's tomb, even though it's only two, two small rooms, and it was sort of like an attic, you know, when they opened the doors, everything had been just shoved in there because Tutankhamun was not a major or particularly important pharaoh, but he was a pharaoh, and so he had to be treated a certain way. So they dug a tomb underneath another tomb, shoved all this stuff in there that they thought he might need, sort of like, okay, Tut, you sort it out later. All right, it's all here. <laughs> And then they sealed it up, and it never got found because it was in a weird place. They have located new tombs as late as 2008 because these have been hidden. Uh, so this most, almost all of that happened in the New Kingdom. You will notice that the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms lasted roughly between 400 and 500 years. The intermediate periods lasted between 100 um, and 100 and 400 years. The third intermediate period lasted much longer. Various peoples, the Hyksos, were responsible for the fall of the, of the Middle Kingdom. They were a people that came from Palestine, from Canaan, a Semitic-speaking people. And we don't know the whole story, but basically the empire started falling apart in Egypt, and the Hyksos took over, and they ruled for quite a long time. And it was when they were defeated that we ended up getting the New Kingdom. There was a group called the Sea Peoples that came in from, we believe, the Aegean. A lot of this is mystery. But they came in and conquered Egypt as well, always from the sea, because the geography of Egypt, the desert protects them, the Sahara Desert on the south and on the uh, west, some desert and the Red Sea and the Arabian Desert protect them on the east, so the only way that people could come in was from the mouth of the Nile. And that's where the Hyksos came in, they actually came by invitation, and the sea people invaded from there. So. These were the major kingdoms. Uh, then after the Third Intermediate Period, we get the late, the late Achaemenid period, which is Persia. This is the great age of Persia, and Persia came in and conquered. Then after Persia conquered, who comes along and defeats the Persians? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered. He marched into Egypt, and they announced him a god and a liberator, crowned him with the crown of Amun, the great god of that period, who is the primary god worshipped in Luxor, where we're going.
When he left and then died before he got back, he died in Babylon, um, and his generals took over. The general Ptolemy, one of his major generals, took over the area of Egypt, and that gives us the Ptolemaic period. All of the Ptolemies, there were like, I think, 13 of them that named themselves Ptolemy. Ptolemy the first, the second, the third, the fourth. After Ptolemy the 13th, we have Cleopatra. She was the last of the Ptolemaic rulers. So she was Macedonian, Greek basically, in her heritage. All of these different periods, the Roman and Byzantine period, where the Romans come in and conquer the whole of the Mediterranean Sea. There is the Arab and Muslim periods where Muhammad and his armies take over this part uh, of the world. And then the Ottoman Empire, in which they Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire. Much of that time it was actually ruled by the, the British. Um, and we'll talk about that in some of the talks we get into later on. But this is the history, a contiguous history, because when Ptolemy came in, he didn't stay Macedonian. He became Egyptian. When Alexander was there, he didn't insist that they crown him as a Greek god. He was crowned as an Egyptian god. So Egypt continued to affect the people that came into their country throughout all this time. These intermediate periods, as I mentioned, was where the kingdoms broke down. And remember that almost everything we're going to see on our visit to Luxor will be from the New Kingdom, which is 1550 to 1069, about a 500-year period. Now, this is Narmer that I mentioned before. Narmer, the angry catfish, this is, uh, I'll show you the whole thing in a second, and this is from what's called the palette of Narmer. You will notice he is here wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt. Here he's wearing the right, white crown of Upper Egypt. These are on flip side of the same piece of stone. And as you'll see in a second, all the other people are so much smaller than him. He apparently was you know, projected in the carvings and things as being a giant. Uh, as was often the case. I'll show you when we talk about birthplace of empires that the the king of the Akkadians, uh, they have him pictured holding a lion like it's a kitten. I mean, it's a full grown lion apparently, but it looks like he's treating it like a kitten. So they always made them bigger than life. Here he is wearing the two crowns separately. Um, there are other places where he is pictured as, as both wearing both crowns. Now you'll notice here is, uh, the, this is, the, the larger version of that. Here you see a whole series of the people he conquered that are beheaded. Uh, these are his soldiers, much smaller than him. Here you see him driving a spike into the head of one of his enemies. So the beheaded corpses and the spike into the skull of an enemy suggest to me that he didn't just talk his way into ruling the upper and lower kingdoms in Egypt. Uh, but he was the first guy. In the Old Kingdom, we have Caffrey enthroned again. They were the ones that built the pyramids and the Sphinx, the uh, oldest kingdom, but they were the ones that really created the Egyptian culture as we know it. They were the ones that um, really started the process of this long, extraordinary artistic history. We then have the Middle Kingdom. This is the King um, uh, Amenhotep III, who was the one who brought them out of the first intermediate period by defeating some of their enemies. During this period of time, and then later the Hyksos, they introduced a lot of things to Egypt that were really valuable, even though they ended up conquering Egypt. They introduced the production of copper, they introduced chariots, the use of, of horses in warfare, they introduced the compound bow. A lot of things came from this period and the intermediate, intermediate period that followed it. And then finally, the New Kingdom that we will be learning more about as we go along. This is one of the most famous of Egyptian sculptures. It is the beautiful bust of Nefertiti. Um, so beautiful and graceful. This is the Memorial Chapel of Hatshepsut that we will be visiting. This is Amenhotep IV, who, was all, who changed his name to Akhenaten. He was part of the New Kingdom dynasties, and Akhenaten changed his name because he tried to turn Egypt from being a polytheistic culture to being a monotheistic culture. He advocated the worship of only one god, the god Aten, who was the manifestation of the sun. Different than Ra, it's like the heat and the light and the corona of the sun were a separate god, Aten, and he tried to force everybody to worship just that one god. Didn't go over very well. As Soon as he died, they tried to obliterate any knowledge of him. They did away with that religion. There used to be a uh, temple to Aten built by, by Akhenaten at the Temple of Karnak, and it was completely destroyed. We know where it was, but it's not there anymore. We, of course, have the burial mask of Tutankhamun. Uh, 
Uh, this is Thutmose the third, who I believe was the the Pharaoh of the time of Moses. When we talk about Moses and the Israelites and crossing the Red Sea, we'll get into that. And then this is the temple at um, Abu Simbel. We won't. Get, that's further south. We won't get there. But I put this up because one of the very significant figures in the New Kingdom was Ramses II, who is uh, Ramses the Great. And you will see at particularly at the Luxor Temple, statues of him. He was the, one of the last of the really great pharaohs. So we'll learn more about him as we go along. But you get some idea of the beauty, the, the architectural beauty and the artistic representation that the New Kingdom did. And you'll see that in paintings, in hieroglyphs, in all sorts of things when we get to Luxor. But that, the, the white pharaohs, I'll put it that way, were not the end of it after a period of time some of the later dynasties actually were during the late period were nubian or sudanese from further south on the nile river the upper nile who eventually in a week time came north and conquered and this is after the the third intermediate period conquered the uh, the nation of egypt and they represented themselves as egyptians you know, here you have sort of an interesting combination of a, a, a animal skin, but this is the headdress of Amun, the, the great king Amun that we'll talk about. He was the primary deity that was worshipped at Luxor. Um, you get images of these pyramids and very, the uh, cobra god on the helmet of a black pharaoh. So there were periods of time when they came from the from the south, but still. They adopted the Egyptian culture and look rather than the other way around. Here again, you have uh, representations of dark skinned people who were in royalty at that time. I want to talk for a few minutes here about hieroglyphs. So many people, their first real introduction to uh, Egypt and the fascinations of Egypt have been because of hieroglyphs. I mentioned to you that we had an Egyptologist on the first of these trips that we did. Emily Teeter, and I asked you to make Egypt and Egyptology your life's focus. And Emily said very quickly, she said hieroglyphs. She said, as a child, I saw these things and I thought, I have to know what they say. And it's interesting that we lost the ability to read hieroglyphs for a, a, a long time. The Back in the end of the previous millennium, you know, so we're talking about around the time of Christ, they stopped using this. The last evidence we have of any hieroglyphs being produced was about 300 AD, but most people had forgotten it. And after that time, from 300 AD, uh, 300 AD until um, around 1800, the early 1800s, we forgot how to read them. And there was a great mystery associated with those. You see these, the way we think of hieroglyphs usually are as carved on stone, and you will see a lot of these when we, we get to Luxor. It is, some people believe, either the oldest or the second oldest kind of writing. It's possible that the Sumerians in the cuneiform was slightly older than this, but it's certainly one of the oldest forms of writing we have. And it was adapted. Not all of it was carved in stone. They also had a form of script that was hieroglyphics as well so that they could write with a pen on papyrus, which is a reed that was, that's produced by, you hammer it out and dry it and become, it becomes a paper-like substance. So these hieroglyphics, they have translated them so that they represent letters and images. And the best example we have of how hieroglyphics works is what's called a rebus. You know what a rebus is? This thing at the top is a rebus. What does that say? You just read hieroglyphics. Basically, hieroglyphics have two kinds of uh, letters or images, forms. Some of them are uh, ideographs. They represent a th an idea, a theme, a thing, just in one image. Some of them are phonemes. They represent sounds, like, you know, I love you. The heart represents love, I, and then, and then you sound. It's a combination of images that represent a thing and then re images that represent a sound. Well, hieroglyphics are just like that. There are uh, over 2,000 different hieroglyphic images. Some of them represent a thing, some of them represent a sound. We've figured out over the, since early 1800s, which is the first time we began to be able to translate this again, 
that some of the images are dual in that a thing that looks like a vulture can be an A, a leg is a B, a staff is a C, a hand is a D, etc. You also have these biliterals like KH, SH, CH, MS. So they do have an alphabet. In fact, they refer to it as an alphabet. But then they also have various other kinds of images like house or man, woman, um, that were the image itself didn't sound like the thing but represented what it was. You get various kinds of images here. Um, this represents safety. The scarab was transformation. The, um, the saint of the plant was union. The two hands upraised, ka is spirit, etc. So we've now figured all of this stuff out, but it is a very complicated language. In, um, we also have numbers. As you're going through looking at hieroglyphs, and you actually, with just a little knowledge, you can decipher some of this stuff. A bar represents a one, what looks like a croquet hoop is 10. A swirl like this is 100. Um, thing that looks like a flagpole is 1,000. 10,000 is a curved staff. 100,000 looks like a parrot uh, sitting there. And one million, I love this one. One million, the symbol for one million is <laughs> you know, one million! So, um, so the combination of these would be used like Roman numerals. You know, you could put these beside one another and you look at them like Roman numerals and you add them up to know what the number is. So we have all of this detail that allows us now to translate the various hieroglyphs. One of the keys, and you'll see this a lot, you want to look for it when we get to Luxor, on the walls, on the columns, that sort of thing are called cartouches. A cartouche is an oval with a line underneath it. Usually they occur like this, where they are vertical, they have hieroglyphic symbols inside them, and there's a line at one end. These are always the names of royalty. Whenever you see a cartouche, it is the name of a royal person. It was believed that this oval, the writing was something that the Egyptians considered very sacred. By writing a name and putting an oval around it, it was considered protection for the pharaoh whose name was on it. Pharaohs would wear these cartouches as amulets. No one other than pharaohs could wear their name as an amulet because it was considered protection against evil. At one point it was thought that as long as the name existed somewhere in writing that a person had not really died, that they would be back. And for a long time they would put these cartouches with the name of the pharaoh on their tombs. But then when they kept getting robbed, people thought, well, that's not a good idea because if they steal the name of the Pharaoh, then they have control of him in the afterlife. Very complicated kind of theology to all of this. Sometimes you will see these cartouches vertically if the name is more easily spelled out uh, vertically or horizontally, I mean, instead of vertically, and the, the line will be on the left-hand side. Now, these were very important in the process of translating hieroglyphs for the first time. This is a handwritten form. There actually are several different, you can imagine these chiseled in stone. It's not like, oh, let me leave a, a note for my wife while I run off to the grocery store, all right, in case she comes home. No, they didn't do that. And the only people who used hieroglyphs anyway were royalty, scribes, priests, etc. It wasn't used for common practices. Certainly they didn't carve into stone anything they didn't think was really worthwhile, but they did develop the ability to write it. And then over a period of time, that writing got simplified and simplified and simplified. So as you can see here, hieroglyphs originally would look like the thing, like a duck, a bug, or scarab, and a bee, and they would go into great care to carve those exactly like that. Then they said, well, there's gotta be an easier way to do that. So they developed a short form that was quicker to carve, not as much detail. Then when they started talking about wanting to write it, like on papyrus, they developed semi-hieroglyphs uh, where there was a detailed form, which still looked pretty much like the thing, and then a short form. Eventually, they developed a language called hieratic, which hieratic is a written development from hieroglyphs, where they turned these various things into simplified um, symbols. All of these represent a B, from the most detailed form of hieroglyph to the simplest form of hieratic writing. This is hieratic, here. It is an adapted form that you could write more easily and quickly from hieroglyphs. We didn't know how to interpret hieratic either 
uh, when we, we first encountered it, we being those people who were in prior to early 1800s. Um, from Heratic, they then developed a, a system called um, Coptic, um, Demo Coptic and then, whoop, these buttons are too small. These were all developed into the Coptic. Coptic gives a, um, Coptic is still used by the way in the Coptic Orthodox churches in Egypt and elsewhere. And then because of Greek influence, they created a form called Demotic, which is writing more in Greek style letters, but still very similar to hieroglyphs. It's a development from hieroglyphics. Now, why is all of this important? These various kinds of things. Well, it's because of this. You know what this is? How did you guess that? Um, this is something else that you can see in the British Museum. In fact, this is one of the most popular items of the British Museum. You can get keychains and you can get bookends and you can get all sorts of things with the Rosetta Stone on it. And the reason it's important is in the late 17, early 1800s, there was a three year period there that France conquered Egypt. Napoleon himself, before he became emperor, um, during the French Revolution, he kept getting promoted and he kept fighting battles and winning them before he became emperor. He went down to Egypt to conquer Egypt, and he did. And one of the things that happened when he was in Egypt is his, his people found this, the Rosetta Stone. The reason it's important is because it is the same message printed in three languages. It is printed in hieroglyphics, it's printed in Demotic, and it's printed in Greek. Well, of course, they knew how to read Greek, when they figured out that this was the same message in three languages, they first translated the ancient Greek, and then they began to pair those words with what they find here in demotic and in hieroglyphics. One of the first things they noticed is that down here they would read the name Ptolemy or one of the other rulers. And they would look up and up here it was symbols, hieroglyphic symbols surrounded by a cartouche. And they figured out first that these cartouches always represented the names of rulers. From that, because they could translate the Greek, they were then able to translate the hieroglyphics, the demotic symbols, and that was the way that they began to develop an understanding. There was a particular French scientist who was involved in this, and he was the first one to really be able to translate it. And from there, they took their knowledge and they, they went further and be, they sent, the French actually sent people to Egypt to copy down these symbols, the ones that had not been on the Rosetta Stone so that they could develop an understanding of it. And it is in that way that we began to understand after almost 1800 years of not knowing what these symbols said, they began to understand what hieroglyphics were all about. You are going to see a ton of hieroglyphics in Luxor. And so you can appreciate when you see the cartouche, that is the name of royalty. Um, you will see various forms of um, symbols, just fascinating stuff. I'm not going to try to teach you any hieroglyphics right now, but uh, you should be, should be very interested in that. So any questions about any of this on the history, the kingdoms, the, the written language of the Egyptians? Questions? And there they sat stunned for some moments. Yes? Uh, a silly question. I've seen this. These are really small. Yes. Uh, the person who made them must have been very careful because they're so small. Did they make mistakes? Well, that's an interesting question. Did they make mistakes? Because this writing is very small. The thing that we have discovered is that in ancient times, because writing was considered sacred, they tended not to make mistakes. Um, because, and, and I'll give you another example of that. In terms of Old Testament Hebrew writing. You know, we, we don't have original writings of the Old Testament. I'm using this as a parallel example, and I'll come back to this. What they discovered when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s in Israel, all the scholars had always said, well, you know, this has all been transcribed. It has been recopied and recopied and recopied, and I'm sure there are mistakes, and people added what they thought that it should say instead of what it did say, so you can't really, can't really trust it as being the original. Well, then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most ancient versions of it. And what they found was the Dead Sea Scrolls were virtually identical to what we had transmitted to us in the 20th century. Now, when I say virtually identical, there are like abbreviations. 
the equivalent of us writing out doctor or writing DR. There are some changes like that. But in terms of any content differences by the writing, there were none. So they had to revise the whole theory about ancient writing and say apparently when people were involved in writing, especially sacred ancient writing, they considered that the most important thing they would ever do and they simply did not make mistakes. If mistakes were made, the item was destroyed. In case of the Hebrew writings, it would literally be buried because they believed that the word of God was sacred and they would it would be given a burial. It was never burned or torn up or reused, it was buried. Well, the similar thing here, in writing these kind of messages, whether they thought it was sacred writing or it was a record of the pharaohs, the kings, the leaders, this was considered a very special responsibility. And, and, and you simply, simply did not make mistakes. So I'm not aware of any mistakes that occurred on this because of the care that was taken with it. And generally, that was true uh, in ancient writing. Yes? Right. The colors they were in have any special significance, for instance, is red more important or gray or whatever? I'm not, the question is that most of what you're going to see will be just bare stone now, although there will be places, especially in the Karnak Temple, where if you look up high and if it's on the side away from the sun, you will see, see some colors. Uh, tomorrow I will show you some images of what the Luxor and Karnak Temples probably looked like originally, and they were brilliant colors. I don't think there was any sort of personality association with the colors. You know, that red represented one thing and green represented another. I believe, uh, again, given this culture, uh, the gold masks and everything, they reflected the same kind of artistic exuberance in terms of the colors of what they painted the walls. And so I'll show you some samples of that tomorrow morning, and then you'll see some of the color, although most of it is, you know, after, in, in this case, after 2,500 years, uh, 3,500 years, sorry, most of that has been washed away or the sun sun is, has deteriorated the colors, etc. But you'll see some of that as well. Yes, uh, back here and then in the front. Music. What, what, what kind of musical thing was going on? What kind of musical thing was going on? Well, the pharaohs particularly liked punk rock. <laughs> they did have music. We have examples of musical instruments. Obviously, we don't have any recordings of that. Uh, <laughs> We don't have any way of reproducing it. They did not have any music signatures uh, or writing, you know, any way of recording the music that I'm aware of. But there are images of musical instruments from those ancient times. I don't think there's ever been any culture without some sort of musical expression. But we don't really know anything about that. Similarly, we don't know how hieroglyphics were pronounced. We don't know how ancient Egyptian was pronounced because, like all ancient languages, uh, ancient Egyptian, it represented in hieroglyphs, heretic, um, and even the demotic, is, had no vowels. They did not write vowels. They, like Hebrew and other languages, write from the right to the left and from the top down. But vowels are breathing sounds. Uh, A-E-I-O-U tell you how, how the thing sounds. It doesn't tell you what it means. Ancient languages were written entirely in consonants. So, it's from the context and from usage, which we don't know what that was, uh, that they would be able to determine which of these words is it. Is it set? Is it sat? Is it sought? Is it, you know, what, what is it? Um, and so we don't know how it was pronounced. Similarly, we don't have any way of recording, of, of knowing what their music was like because there was no way to record that. Right in front of him, yes? So I'm looking at the picture of the Rosetta Stone in three different periods. Mm -hmm. So the first was written and then it was blank below, and then they added, and then they added more. Is that the way it went through time? And no, this is the same message. See, this is hieroglyphics. This is demotic, neither one of which we knew how to read before we found this. We couldn't translate them. Right. This is Greek, but they were all written at the same time. So when were they written? At the, during the Greek um, yes, during the Greek period, so probably sometime in the, in the early first millennium AD, meaning uh, some, because the last writing we have an example of was in the 300s. It says circa 196 BC on your... 196 BC. <laughs> so that would have been earlier, slightly earlier than what I just said. But the idea is the Greeks were still there and they were still influencing it. So it was really a study uh, of, of the different hieroglyphics through time. Well, it... it a study of the hieroglyphics, but more likely they had a message that they wanted to communicate to everybody. Some people read hieroglyphics, some people read demotic, and some people read Greek. So they created this as sort of a billboard 
that everyone would be able to read. It's been, it's, it's fairly common down through history that people forget how to read their own language when a new language comes along. That was particularly true, for instance, the Hebrew people, the, uh, the people of Israel, forgot how to read Hebrew after Alexander introduced Greek after a few generations. And that's why in the, around the sim, same period uh, as this, they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Um, well before the time of Christ, several hundred years before Christ, because the people no longer knew how to read Hebrew, they knew how to read Greek. And so if you're trying to reach a group of people that have multiple languages that are still common, then you do the same message in different symbols. And that comparison is what allowed them to translate the hieroglyphs and the demotic. Yes? What is the message? Yeah. It refers to various rulers. Um, Ptolemy is one of the first names that they were able to identify because you know Ptolemy in Greek and then they were able to go up and say oh that's there's this oval symbol that's got these hieroglyphs those must mean Ptolemy and so it had to do with the rulers of the time the specific message I don't know I could look it up and I'm not sure what it was I think when I, when I went to the British Museum it's a rather prosaic proclamation about taxes or right. something like that it's always about taxes isn't yeah. it <laughs> yeah so again it's something they wanted everybody to be able to read so they put it in three languages but it had to do with the rulers and and uh, taxes that they, they told him at the british museum other questions uh here if napoleon found the rosetta stone how did it end up in england <laughs> <laughs> london is this giant vacuum for artifacts um it's at, when the English and the French were fighting, like, like they've always been fighting, um, this is after the uh, Napoleonic Wars, a lot of the area, you know, the British actually conquered the French, marched into France. At some point, they retrieved the Rosetta Stone. I'm not sure exactly where it was, and said, hey, this is cool. Let's take it back like all the other cool things that we've taken back to London. And so they did. And it's there. Now, tomorrow I will show you the some of the pictures of the Luxor temple, there are two obel um, obelisks that were in front, needles. One of those is in the square in Paris now. So a lot of this stuff ended up in, in, in uh, European capitals. But London has always had, because they were the world's largest empire was, was the British Empire. And they have always had a fascination with taking artifacts from various parts of the world that they controlled and bringing them back and they often have said, well, we can take care of them and those folks can't, like they did with the Elgin marbles from, from Athens. Um, they've used that excuse, but that's fairly common. I mean, the Portuguese did the same thing. Uh, the Portuguese, particularly, they love the idea of forests and plants. If you go to Busaku Forest, which is a royal forest in Portugal now, it was the home of the last of the royal palaces of the Portuguese royal family. Uh, the forest has plants from everywhere the Portuguese Empire existed, from Brazil and from um, India and from all around the world. So it's very common for these empires to gather up stuff they find interesting and bring it back home. And that's what the British did. A now, plant is one thing, but yeah. art and the culture. The history it, that belongs to another country, I right. just don't understand. Well, the, the city of Babylon, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the Babylonian capital, beautiful i mean it, one of the wonders of the world was the hanging gardens of babylon and they had this beautiful gate it was glazed tile blue with lions and things it's in berlin it's in the pergamum museum in berlin so this this happens all the time and you think it's pretty terrible in fact there are a lot of international laws against that now you cannot take artifacts out of countries now uh, according to international law this lady you had your hand up yes it's actually an observation. I'm, I'm looking at the writing there, and I've always thought of hieroglyphics as being pretty complex and maybe inefficient. But I'm looking at the, the, the fact that what I see there is that it becomes more complex as it goes down, yet it's saying the same thing, which I, I, I found a little dumbfounding. I was not expecting to see that. Right, right. Well, we don't know how much of it is lost. Obviously, it's been broken. So it could have been much, much more hieroglyphics than the rest. What you're saying is true, but then it's surprising sometimes the way translations happen. While uh, hieroglyphics are very complex, the fact that they have 2,000 different symbols, either, either idea, uh, ideograms or phonograms, it's either the sound or the image that they're conveying, um, sometimes that can be very efficient. You know, you have one, one symbol that may mean 
um, angry catfish, you know, if that's what you want to say. And so there are times which that can be very efficient, and languages differ in that. Carolyn and I live in Mexico, and we're sometimes astonished in either direction. Usually English is a very efficient language because it's had so many different languages affect it. You know, it has the French from the Norman invasion, it's got Scandinavian languages from, from uh, the Viking invasions. But there are times in which an English phrase or message that gets translated into Spanish is much longer, and there's some, sometimes it's shorter. It's a very com difficult thing to try to predict. Other questions? Yes? Well, this was the primary one. There have been other cases since then that they have found where it has multiple language on it. But this is the one that was really the key. This was the key to translating, because we knew Greek, the other languages. And since then, they found others. See, prior to that, it wasn't sufficient. There wasn't enough for them to be able to make enough of a translation, enough of a, a, a correlation, in order to be able to make it mean anything. But they have found others since then, because there are other, are other cultures there. And particularly if it has to do with taxes, then they want to make sure everybody could read it. Thank you all very much. We will be back in here at 10 o'clock tomorrow.